Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I'll be upgrading the service at my own house. It's a house that was built in 1979. If you didn't know, I live in Point Pleasant Borough, New Jersey. We'll be upgrading just the panel only today. Uh, I got started on the grounding electrode system. I haven't completed that. I hope to complete that by the end of the day. Coming up on 14,000 subscribers. It's a very exciting time. Hope you guys enjoy this video. So at 9 a.m., it's about time we get started. So we're gonna be done at a reasonable hour, probably about six o'clock. It's a full panel and there's gonna be a lot of work. So hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Anyhow, this is my setup. Um, a few years ago, I put in this sub panel. It is connected to an old Challenger 50 amp breaker, which is what I was in the panel there. Obviously that's not acceptable nowadays. This is an old GE panel, which you guys know I don't like. I also don't like this. They sleeved a bunch of these branch circuits through this two inch conduit. I think it's two inch. I don't think it's three, it could be three, but I just don't like that. The ambient temperature inside here is very hot. So I'm anxious to get this out of here and see if there's any damage done to the sheathing or to the conductors themselves. Uh, we have a lot of electrical appliances here. We have a 30 amp uh, wall oven that I just put in for my wife a couple weeks ago, a new replacement. Uh, we have a hot water heater or, or just a plain water heater that's electric. Then of course we have the electric clothes dryer. Uh, so I have a whole bunch of 240 volt circuits that are converted to 120 volt circuits. And you can do that by removing the one um, white grounded neutral conductor from the bus bar, obviously over then to the ground bar. Uh, down here we have, this is crazy. So this right here is for the condensing unit that we no longer use. We wanna get that replaced right away. So that'll be coming out today. And the most fascinating thing is a sub panel somebody did, a homeowner obviously, or someone without any experience did this. But this is a 8-2 on a single pole 40 amp circuit breaker. That's the most ridiculous thing setup I've ever seen. But that's what powers the sub panel inside our okay office. Because once I, I shut off the main breaker, I'm gonna undo this, uh, the meter. And as you can see, with all these electrical appliances with the air conditioning going, it's spinning like a record. So it'll be good to give it a break for a day. Um, a few years ago, we replaced this and I replaced some of the wiring before they had the disconnect. It was directly behind the condensing unit. Obviously that's a violation. So we extended the circuit and moved the disconnect right underneath the meter, which kind of screws me today because what I wanted to do is I wanted to come out of the bottom of this meter and extend it to an LB and then come into the bottom of the panel and have my main breaker down at the bottom. But I cannot do that because I am not willing to move all this equipment I just put in a couple years ago. It's not totally necessary that we have the LB and come into the bottom. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have the exact same setup as they had previously where the nipple coming in from the back of the meter is gonna go into the back of the panel in the upper left-hand corner. This meter really gave me a hard time coming out. It was uh, locked in there pretty good. And you gotta be real careful because if you're not careful and your fingers go in there, that could be the end of you. So eventually I get it, as you see, and uh, we're ready to go. So once that meter's pulled, I'm just gonna put this cover back on there. It was raining a little bit that day. And uh, I just wanted to cover up the, uh, the live conductors as best I could. It only drizzled, so it wasn't so bad. So normally I would use my fluke testers. They're right there in my pocket, but I know that the power is off, but I just wanted to use my tick tracer just to make sure there's no magnetic field left over at all in case there was a problem on the utility end. So, uh, from here on out, we're going to start ripping out all of the branch circuits. First, we're going to disconnect them from the breakers, and we're going to tag our double pole circuit breakers. There's mostly 30 amp double pole circuit breakers. There was a bunch of 20 amp double poles previously, and they were mostly for uh, baseboard electric heaters throughout the house, which we've since gotten rid of. So I've left those circuits in place where the heaters were in case I ever need to use a circuit for something. I know it's available. I would have to trace it back inside this panel. Most of them are in the sub panel now, as you see on the left side there. And uh, that tells me that they were added much later on. I could be wrong about that though. 
So once I've disconnected all the conductors from the circuit breakers, we're going to remove all the grounds and neutrals here. And then eventually we're going to remove those service entrance conductors, which supply the main breaker here. Those are the big, I think it was three aught copper actually. So you really only need two aught, but I'm not sure what the code was in 1979 as far as sizing those conductors. It is a 200 amp service. It's going to remain a 200 amp service. So even though it's technically not an upgrade, we are upgrading the equipment. Any kind of equipment that's over 40 years old probably could use an upgrade. Uh, there's been major advances in circuit breaker technology since then. And uh, you don't want to rely on an old piece of equipment that could save your life. Should you have an overload, a short circuit, or a ground fault. And as you can see there, it's a two and a half inch piece of PVC with all the Romex slide, slid inside of it or sleeved inside of it. And the reason why they did that is they use all single connectors up at the top and they ran out of knockouts to bring all the home runs into. Uh, so I believe there is a way around this to make that code, uh, to not violate the code. I don't particularly like it, especially here when it's inside of a wall inside of that conduit. The ambient temperature could affect those cables. I examined all the cables and there was not a problem at all. And I was surprised by that. Uh, but I managed to put in double connectors here for each of the Romex connectors and got rid of that two and a half inch sleeve. This is our French Bulldog Gus. And of course you guys know my German Shepherd Gonzo. These are my two best boys. They were with me in the garage the entire day while we did this work. You can say hello in the comments if you'd like. Okay, so here I'm loosening the set screws on the load side on my service entrance conductors. And then finally, I'm able to remove the old electrical panel. So I always like this part of the job whenever I'm upgrading a panel or doing a service. And there you see it's a two and a half inch piece of conduit that had, I don't know, maybe 12 uh, NM circuits there inside of it. And they just go upstairs above the garage, which is an attic space. And they're laid across in a spot where it's not subject to physical damage. So, all right, so I'm taking out the, um, the KO seal for my service entrance conductors. And then I'm knocking out the side panels so that I'm able to use the uh, screws to attach it to the wooden studs on either side of the panel. And then fitting it in there is uh, usually, it, well, the, the opening is 14 and a half inches. And so normally the panels are sized just like that to fit in there. But this one was a little snug. And I probably, in hindsight, should have used a wooden 2x4 to smack up against the metal frame of the enclosure. But I didn't, so I used a regular hammer. And uh, there was no problems getting this in. But you can see I damaged the enclosure a little bit there getting it in. Uh, the panel cover went on without problem. And so now for the next couple hours, I'm just trying to get all these cables inside the panel so that I can terminate them to my ground lugs, to my ground bars, my neutral bars, and of course, finally to the circuit breakers for the branch circuits. At some point during the day, I had to run out to my supplier, Good Friend Electric. Shout out to Good Friend. They're in Tom's River, but the branch that I go to is normally in Brick. Brian and Steve there do a fantastic job. So, Brian and Steve, you guys are watching this, or people that go to Good Friend Electric are watching this, uh, say hello in the comments. That'd be terrific. Anyhow, uh, Steve was there that day, and I just wanted to change. As you can see, there's a metal nipple between the back of the meter and the and the panel here up in the upper left hand corner and I just wanted to update the uh, the bonding bushing because it's a piece of steel the code tells me I need to make sure that that's bonded to the system so I can do that by either a bonding lock nut which I'm not a huge fan of I just feel like it's not a good as connection to ground to bond that piece of metal uh, than it is for a bonding bushing and the bonding bushing just means there's a lug on there 
with a um, properly sized bonding jumper, we'll call it, from the bonding lug to the ground bus inside the panel here. You'll see that later on. Uh, I take my time, and I think I edited the video so you can see that specifically. And of course, you gotta size that correctly. So if you have 200 amp service entrance conductors, you're gonna need a number four equipment grounding equipment grounding conductor jumper does that make sense anyway that's all laid out in article 250 tech 122 and it must be sized by no smaller than that's what's required in table 250 tech 66 which tells us all about our grounding electroconductors and sizing for our grounding electroconductors so the jumper size for the bonding bushing to the grounding bus is number four copper that's what I used anyhow you can see a big mess of wires here this was a serious mess and there I am changing out the bonding bushing and making sure it's nice and tight and secure and then there's set screws on the bonding bushes as well as well which mechanically fastens it to the nipple all right so here some of my conductors are short so I'm adding a neutral bar not a ground bar I'm adding a neutral bar which means it's isolated from the enclosure and the reason why we need to do that is because section 200 tack 2 I believe um, prohibits using the enclosure as a current carrying conductor and a neutral is a current carrying conductor so same thing here we're using the big lug there at the top to attach it to our ground bus on the panel and I'm using number four copper for this jumper as well and that's just gonna give me a bunch of more spaces uh, more terminals to terminate my short equipment grounding conductors and my neutral conductors. Okay, so this is my bonding jumper from the uh, bonding bushing where the service entrance conductors come through. And as you can see, I'm just going to tighten down this set screw that's attached to the bonding bushing, which is attached to the nipple that bridges the, the gap between the panel and the back of the meter. And so uh, that's a number four piece of copper. We just make a nice tight connection right there and we're just gonna bring this to the uh, grounding bar. There's a lug for the number four uh, to bond these pieces together. This is the main breaker assembly here. So this is where my main bonding jumper is. And I don't know if I show it too often here, but uh, the panel is a screw that bonds the neutral to the enclosure itself, which makes this the main disconnect and the main place for all my uh, grounding and bonding takes place. This is where the neutrals and the grounds bond. Okay. And there's my final termination to the ground bus inside the panel. If you guys are enjoying this video, do me a favor, hit that like button. And if you like this content and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. Now there is my existing grounding electro that goes to my water main. Uh, and the water main is on the other side of my house. And I haven't updated that yet. This is number six copper, which I'm not sure if it was okay back then in 1979. But nowadays, we would have to run number four copper. Or as you see, and how I prefer to do it, I use a number two aluminum from the main disconnect to the water main. So we're going to have to update that at some point. For now, we're going to keep it this size. It was like this size since 1979. And I don't anticipate there being too many problems in the near future. But also in the future, I'm going to be updating that. This is my grounding electro that I did probably a year and a half ago, two years ago. I drove two ground rods outside. And I put the uh, grounding bridge outside as well. And then I just left it underneath the panel until I was ready to do this upgrade. And right there, you'll see a good uh, shot of the uh, whole house surge protector that I use. This is a plug-on, so anytime I have a flush mount panel, which is what this is, where it's flush with the wall, you're going to have to use a plug-on uh, surge protector. The other kind that I like, and I think they're better quality and they're better, they give better protection, is a surface mount um, surge protector, which I could have done here, but it's, I don't like the setup that Eaton gives you for the flush mount. Uh, assembly I mean, it works and obviously it's approved to do it like that uh, I don't like it it's just um, I prefer to plug on here in this case 
Let me know in the comments what you think. All right, so there's a lot of circuits here, as you can tell. And so what I'm doing is I'm stripping back the sheathing at the top so it makes, makes a nice uh, workmanlike appearance. The minimum amount of sheathing we need inside a box or an enclosure like this is a quarter inch. You could leave up to a foot of uh, the sheathing inside, the, inside a box or an enclosure like this. It just doesn't look very neat, but you can do it. It's not a code violation, so to speak. And so there I'm tying in my short grounds and neutrals to that neutral bar that I installed um, earlier. Just trying to make this look as neat as possible. Obviously, there's a lot of conductors here. And what you want to do is you want to use, you want to find out your shortest conductors and make sure you use the shortest path to terminate that conductor. And so that the longer ones, if they're long enough, don't reach the bottom to where you terminate. I hope that makes sense. But if you have short conductors, you want to use those first and obviously connect those to the terminals and to the circuit breaker first so you don't have as many extensions on these branch circuits. I believe I had maybe three or four uh, wires that I, or conductors that I had to extend because they just weren't short. They just weren't long enough to reach their destination. And that's going to leave for a cleaner look inside your panel. Uh, obviously, I know I'm not the best panel terminator there is i understand that i think i do a pretty good job things are neat and organized inside there and i like to pass my inspections and some people will say well how come the neater you are then you're able to remove things and change things up later on well very rarely do you need to move a circuit inside the panel very rarely all right i'm doing this a long time so i never want to leave uh, more conductor than i need inside that panel because it's just going to take up gutter space and make things more difficult if you do add a circuit. But most of the time, I'm not moving a circuit out of this panel to move it someplace else. That just, that just doesn't happen. All right, so here I'm also adding another ground bar. Now, this is different than the neutral bar. This is connected to the bus, uh, to the enclosure itself, because I have some short conductors. These will just be grounding uh, equipment grounding conductors, no neutrals here, because you cannot use the enclosure as a current path. And I'm pretty sure that's what Article 200, TAC 2 um, states. I believe that's the right article. 200.2A, I believe, is the NEC article that explains that not using neutral. And how do I know that? Because about five or six years ago, I got called out on that on a job that I did, and I never even knew it existed. So I don't know everything, I know a lot of things, but I do not know everything, and I can be wrong. So I'll just take that for what it is. So I do think I'm missing some footage here, I could be wrong. But now that um, I have all my grounds and neutrals terminated, I'm able to put the circuit breakers in. And I no, don't normally use the tie wraps here. I figured I'd give that a shot, and I can always cut them off later. I believe that this calls bundling. And if you don't know what bundling is, that means when you have more than three current carrying conductors right next to each other, it's going to build more heat. And so if you were running those conductors inside a piece of conduit, you would have to derate them all. So I was always taught to not run the wires real close like that to each other or use a tie wrap but I wanted to make this look neat because there's a ton of wires inside this panel and so one by one I'm terminating the uh, conductors to the circuit breakers I'll do it on the left side first then I'll do it on the right side and uh, we're getting closer and closer in the day to be able to turn the power back on Now I did, you can see the wires on the side there in that sub panel, the four blue wires. That's basically back feeding that sub panel right there. And that sub panel to the left is, it supplies the, um, the panel inside my office where I edit my videos on my computer here. We have some lights, we have a TV, and basically there's the hangout for the dogs. We watch sports back here and obviously edit these videos. Anyhow, I wanted to be able to supply some air conditioning in the middle of the day so when I took lunch, I could sit in here and... Uh, check out YouTube and be cool and have some lights 
And I was able to do that all by running my uh, 7,000 watt portable electric start Generac generator, which is uh, served me well, very well. I actually bought it on the Facebook marketplace. Normally that generator goes for about $1,800. And I bought it from somebody for like $600 because when I went there, the electric start did not work. And so I told them that I was going to have to fix that. And I wound up getting like $200 off the asking price. So instead of $800, I got it for $600. So I got it for a third and it, was only, it only had like maybe 35 hours on it. So I'm very happy about having that portable generator. And now that I have this set up, if I'm not home, my wife will even be able to start it because it's an electric start. Maybe I should make another video on the portable generator system once I put it in. I think I will do that. Hey, if you like this video, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up. There's the protective covers around my service entrance conductors. Obviously the one on the left, I'm gonna redo this when I put the meter in. I don't like the way that sits in there, it could be nicer. Not a big deal, it's working just fine. All right, so here I'm putting some um, antioxidant on my meter where I plug it in so that when I put the meter in to energize everything, uh, it'll go in smooth. It was difficult to take it out, so here we go. Obviously, I'm going to go ahead and test between uh, leg and leg and then leg to ground. Uh, before I turn the main breaker on to make sure I have the proper voltage and there's no damage done to the meter uh, So that's thing you want to do is turn that main breaker on and not have the right voltage and perhaps Break something with sensitive electronic equipment inside the house So uh, I always want to check and verify and I think you see that in most of my videos Once the meter's in, I'm able to turn the main breaker on. Uh, now all these breakers are brand new out of the box. And so when they come brand new out of the box, they're actually in the trip position. So as I put them in, they're still in the trip position. So what I'm doing here is I'm turning everything to the off position before coming back and turning everything into the on position. I hope that makes sense. Always one at a time and try to keep your face away from them in case there is a problem. And there's my final result. That's zoomed in. Not exactly the best quality right there, but you can see what I did. So after uh, I put the power back on, I took a little break. I was able to have dinner, take my dogs to the park and hang out for a few, check out YouTube. Uh, and around 8 o'clock at night, I came back and I started cleaning up the garage a little bit. I still have some more to do today. Before my wife gets home, she's going to want to park in the driveway, but she's going to have to wait a little bit longer because I had to edit this video. It's now Sunday at about 12.30 in the afternoon, and I still haven't cleaned up the garage. But I did manage to get the panel cover on here and make sure that was all safe, and of course the sub-panel as well. So guys, I know it took a while for me to get this video out. I was sick this week, but thank you for being patient, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. I think that's going to be it for tonight. As you can see, I still have a big mess to clean up here in the garage. But we did get a lot of work done today. And we got a nice little package from Home Depot. New hat. This was on sale. I think I got the hat for free, but I want to try these new Milwaukee screwdrivers with the pushing grip. These are new. Although these look like they've been in water. Hmm. Long lasting. Very nice. Of course, that's how they're going to sell it. We'll see. Precise fit. We will see for sure. So, big thumbs up if you like this video so far. So, today we took out the old panel, put the new panel in, this is it. It's got this custom uh, sticker here from where we bring our Gonzo and Gus. Where are they? You guys want to get in the, in the movie?
How we doing? Anyway, I've had this panel ready to go and do this change for so long that this sticker that I have right here that I got from the Pern Pooch where we bring our dogs when we go on vacation or if they need daycare or where Gonzo gets groomed. Uh, they gave me this sticker and it said, in case of emergency, animals inside. It said one dog here or one cat, but it just said one dog and then I think the cat, you have to check it out. So I had to change it. Two dogs live here. That's how long we've had the panel. Um, obviously, we are still going to have to identify all the circuits. All right, but as you can see, we got our interlock right here. That will not turn on with this interlock in the way. And this interlock lock will not slide up unless the main breaker is off. Uh, we used every opening in this panel today, which I knew we were going to be close. I thought my count was 39. It was off. Obviously, we eliminated a couple things and we moved a couple things. We took um, the single pole 40 that's supplying power to the office sub panel. So it's still 100 and it's still 120 volt circuit 40 amp single 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 leg service uh, to the sub panel in the office. Nothing theoretically wrong with that, but you're only going to be able to get you know seven circuits off the 140. I don't know. I'm used to supplying a four wire feed for a sub panel. So that you get the proper voltage and you can put double pole circuits in there so eventually we're going to do that those are the two conduits that are inside the sub panel that are on the outside they go all the way back to the office which is back this way already and it's this cable right here so we just temporarily extended it that's not going to stay like that eventually that circuit will be derived or that feeder will be derived from the sub panel um we added the whole house surge protection all right that's a nice feature to have and of course the portable generator wiring we didn't run the circuit yet for the portable generator wiring because i'm not sure i would like to put my watt meter and my power back sensor right up here along with an emergency light maybe underneath this overhang this storage space up here but i'm not sure if i'm going to get rid of that yet i think i kind of want to have that i don't think the inspector will say anything i didn't put this this was here when i moved in but obviously this wasn't here when the house was built because this would be a violation this is higher than this is i guess we do have six feet of clearance here and anyway this wasn't here when the house was built i'm sure of it um not that we're gonna have to move it but i would like to put that equipment up here so that i could see it uh easily while i'm working in here and somebody else doing it of course we have the generator portable generator commands to turn the generator on transfer over to the portable generator and then of course when the power comes back the power back is going to be located right up above here beep 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 make a crazy noise you have to turn it off and that'll tell you that the utility power has come back on and then you can do the reverse when the utility power is restored so it's been a long day i'm sweaty this is like my fourth or fifth t-shirt today so it's crazy but i got done doing the panel around 4 30 which was great i was able to take my dogs i was able to take a little break then i was able to take my dogs to the park and then eventually we got dinner and we ate dinner and so now it's gee i don't know 8 30 still kind of early and uh that's it for the video hope you guys enjoyed that if you haven't subscribed we'll see you on the next one thanks